Okay. And JJ, your your title, you were 26, 27 years in the FBI? 26. 26, 26 years. 26 years, FBI? special agent. Okay. Supervisor. Okay. Mostly in Philadelphia? Uh, Philadelphia and Indianapolis. Okay. Thanks so much for being with us today. We've been We've been really devoted to the Dulce Maria Alves case since it broke, which was mid-September. So we've set up a timeline here at the Comcast Technology Center, and I just want to walk you through this a little bit. Um, this is one of the last images of Dulce that we saw. This was taken at a gas station, and there was surveillance video um, at that gas station. How important is surveillance video in a case like this one? Well, surveillance video could be critical in this, this type of investigation, not necessarily that picture of her, but obviously, going forward, they're going to look for any surveillance video from that day or from that day to today. Um, you know, it's surveillance video that could capture an image of her somewhere. So that becomes critical. Um, phone tips are going to be pouring in all the time. Um, you know, when there's coverage like this, the tips will go up. Sure. So, you know, with those tips, um, you know, if someone says, we think we saw someone who matched the description, obviously surveillance video is what's going to help investigators narrow down whether those tips are real or not. Right, absolutely. This is the mother. This is Noema Alaves. So I'm walking you through basically the first couple days. So this is September 16th, days one and two. So we saw Noema at the search. You're going to see her right over here again. This is the playground. It's since undergone a little bit of a renovation. It was under construction at the time that Dulce vanished or was taken. And then right here we see local Bridgeton police and they're interviewing the mother. How much will her demeanor count on this full first day of the search? Well, certainly in a child abduction like this, particularly over time, the parents' demeanor, their activities, their behaviors become very important. But I think we have to be a little careful in maybe assigning too much importance to how she was acting and behaving immediately after the abduction. Different parents uh, the walk different ways. Some people right. have said, you know, she wasn't out in the woods searching, she was eating pizza. She seemed very nonchalant and right. not, not, it, not frantic or crying or hysterical. Right, but you're talking about a very, very stressful situation that most people are never going to experience in their lives. It's hard to predict exactly how someone is going to act, but certainly the people who look at behavioral analysis, for example, in the FBI, the behavioral analysis unit, who will be assisting in this type of investigation, they are gonna look at her behavior, not only that first day, but up to today. You know, Through all of her interactions with law enforcement, um, any public statement she's made, they're gonna be looking at that to try and get a picture of kind of what is she like normally? How is she under stress like us. this? Right, sure. so it's, it is important, but I, we can't say just from her behavior on day one, you know, that she's hiding something or she's not giving information, I think that's that's a little, uh, you can't really make that assumption. Sure. The next day, so day two, September 17th, um, before an Amber Alert went out, the, the police talked about they're searching for a red van, sliding door, tinted windows, and the search for Dulce. How important is this description? Well, it's important and then obviously they're trying to get information out to the public. They, they want as many eyes out there looking for a red van with a sliding door and tinted windows. Again, it's going to generate a lot of false tips because there's a lot of red vans out there that are going to match that description. But it's also going to give the investigators something to look at. They're going to be pulling surveillance video from as many places as they can get. I mean, in this day and age, um, you know, in the old days, detectives used to walk and knock on doors and ask people, did you see or hear anything? You know, now, in addition to that, they're asking, do you have a camera? Uh, you know, and everyone so has many, a cell phone. Yeah, so yeah. many, but even so many uh, private homeowners put cameras around their houses. Uh, businesses have cameras that cover the outside. Um, there are transportation agencies that put cameras up uh, to monitor intersections. So there's a lot of video out there. So, so putting a description out of a vehicle so that they can try and match that to any video they might get or something someone might have seen becomes very important. Now, of course, the issue is, is it an accurate description? Are they really looking for a red van or is this, you know, a tip that they got that may or may not be accurate? Did it come from someone who was a witness to the incident? Or did it come from the younger sibling? It came from her little brother, right. Manny. It came That's, from a three-year-old. So exactly. So yeah, how, I think the prosecutor has described it as a child of tender age. So it's how much credibility or weight do they put in? Right. I mean, certainly that. you wouldn't expect someone, a child of that age, to knowingly lie about something. But how accurate are they going to be in their description? Certainly. Um, certainly. You know, of knowing a, a red van, a sliding door, things like that. Right. The Amber Alert, the fact that it was 28 to 30 hours after the fact. How detrimental is that to the case now, if, if at all? Well, you know, looking back at it, I think you'd say certainly it should have been, it would have been better to get that Amber Alert out in the hours after the abduction because then the person is 
uh, if it's in fact a true abduction and, and she's in a, a van or a vehicle with somebody mm -hmm. um, and you've got a description to put out, you've got eyes who can see that and you're closer to the scene of the crime. The mm -hmm. more time that goes on, the potentially further away from the scene of the crime that person and that victim and that vehicle gets. And it becomes a, you know, a much wider search grid. It becomes a lot more difficult. The 911 call came almost immediately to police. So we didn't get our hands on this 911 call until about three weeks later. And we hear her voice on there. I don't remember what clothes she was wearing, but describing. she was wearing. I just she couldn't her exactly remember the outfit her daughter was wearing. What, what, how much does this weigh in on the case, her call and the demeanor there? Right. I think it's the same as her demeanor when she's being interviewed right after the abduction you know, right after the call she reports it. Um, it's the same thing. I mean, clearly this is someone under a great deal of stress. Um, 911 calls, and when you listen to them from all kinds of different crimes, you know, people react differently. So it's, it's hard to put too much importance on exactly what her demeanor was, but it's one small piece that behavioral analysis analysts are going to look at. Um, you know, this is how she was acting immediately after the reported abduction. This is how she was an hour later. This is how she was a week later. So it's all little pieces of the puzzle that they're going to put together. You know, now that we're five months out, there's been a lot of kind of public images of her going on TV, sure. um, going on TV shows and, you know, making these pleas, um, her and other family members. Right. And it's important to remember when you talk about this kind of child abduction, stranger child abductions, are very rare in reality. It makes big news like this, but they're actually very rare. Most murders in general, most child abductions are a relative. Know. Someone they know. Yeah, someone close to the victim. And that's where every investigation starts. So imagine concentric circles of relationship around a victim. They're always going to start closest in. Work their start way out. Start to work their way out. Work their way out. From the first couple of days, there were dive teams in the water from different townships, different neighboring police townships. If there had been a piece of evidence, an article of clothing, a, a weapon, if you will, what would water do to that evidence over this amount of time? Well, obviously, water, it can be very destructive to evidence. I mean, DNA evidence, um, physical evidence. Um, and that's why people throw weapons and things into water, because it does it can, you know, rust and things and, and other chemical processes of water can destroy evidence, can destroy, uh, it can ruin the ability to analyze that evidence and, and really get useful evidence from it. So, uh, you know, it is important. It's unknown whether they found anything. Obviously, they haven't said. Sure. Um, but that would be a normal thing if there is a body of water anywhere near an abduction like this, they're going to start looking at that. Um, we've seen it time and time again. They may even, at some point, if they get a tip, they might be in different bodies of water or the same bodies of water looking again. Right. One other thing I wanted to ask just while we were on this side before we move over to some of the players in the game, which, we're, which we see here, Dad, also, we, we got some cell phone video of Dulce singing. We hear her voice. I don't know if that weighs into the investigation, too, like hearing, you Not know, really. hearing her voice no. on that. Um, but with the volume of people that went to the park that day and um, citizens, lay people, does that are they trampling on the evidence? Are they trampling on um, something that could be of importance? Potentially Absolutely. could have the, could the park have been closed? Should it have been closed? Could anything have been done a little bit differently in your eyes? Uh, that's a hard call to make now in retrospect. Yeah, in retrospect, you might say, yes, it should have been closed immediately. But think about it contemporaneous with the reported abduction. You've got a little girl missing. Everyone wants to do everything they can to find her. So that search party is going to start from the last place she was seen, the playground, and they're going to start searching the whole park. Right. But clearly... And police accepted the help on the notion, first of all, that this might have been a child lost from playing hide right. and seek. She might have wandered off. That, that's the most common thing. A child in a park wanders off, maybe gets lost in a little wooded area, and, you know, found by you know, volunteers who are searching. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly, if it was an abduction, and that person who abducted her walked through the playground to get her, there were footprints there. You know, there could be potential, um, you know, shoe print analysis. Mm -hmm. um, if the vehicle drove through something where maybe it leaves tire treads, you know, there's information and evidence that you can get from those kinds of things. Might the person who abducted her dropped something on the ground? You could know? this come down to a piece of chewing gum, JJ, a cigarette butt? It, it could come down to a fiber, a hair or a fiber from the carpet of the car that abducted her. I mean, cases have been made on something as small as a microscopic fiber that's been analyzed and matched to the person. Or something that they transferred 
maybe from their house on their shoes to the crime scene. That happens all the time. Okay. It's a central principle of forensic collection and analysis. So per se, trash cans at the park, they would have gone through all of yes. that. What was thrown away that day? What does right. it say about who Every was time there? we move from one spot to another, when you come from your house to the NBC10 studios, you might be bringing microscopic fibers from carpets in your house, from carpets in your car, and now they're here and vice versa. So we could establish that you were in the NBC10 studios when we're on camera, but we could also establish forensically that you were here right. um, by matching fibers or things that we find in your office at your desk to things that are at your house. Sure. Same thing in an outdoor crime scene. Obviously, it's a lot harder um, because you have the weather and elements. And in a case like this, you've got well-meaning volunteers and police who are trying to find a missing little girl. They're not predicting that five months later we're not going to be any closer to finding her and we might have needed that forensic evidence. So it's a hard balance to say, should we close the park or should we conduct a thorough search and find her? Understood. Just since we initially had set up your interview last week and then we're, we're talking to you this week, um, a psychic uh, says that she has communicated and has communicated before with um, with the dead and that and that Dulce is speaking to her and that she's buried near her school in a very shallow grave, that she's been sexually assaulted. There have been numerous psychics that have weighed in on this case. Does the FBI, Wood Investigators, Wood Bridgeton Police give any credibility to a psychic? I can't speak for the Bridgeton Police, but I can tell you that the FBI is not going to put any credibility in information that psychics provide. If tip calls come in, uh, whoever's taking that tip call is going to, is going to try to determine What's the veracity of that information? How can we establish that what you're telling us might be true? And if someone says, I saw a vision versus I was in a store and I saw someone matching the description, those are two very different things. And typically, law enforcement in general is not going to put any credence in what psychics are going to say. It's unfortunate, but in a, in a crime like this or a situation like this, psychics people come out of the woodwork and they're going to prey on the desperation of the family or the desperation of loved ones.